thanks for coming. I appreciate very much uh, your attendance. Um, the title of this program, uh, this talk, uh, I know is provocative. I wanted to get your attention. Um, the sign that I put out that had the just say no to bullying uh, was another way to, to capture your attention, but doesn't necessarily represent what I, I'm going to suggest we should do about this problem of bullying. It's my goal to expand our definition of this issue uh, because it's too focalized. The topic is too limited right now, and uh, the existing uh, definitions and approaches of addressing this problem uh, are largely ineffective. Uh, but follow what would appear to be the appropriate and logical way to solve a problem like this. Uh, but uh, the problem is growing, and it continues to grow. And if you've heard the expression, just when you think it can't get worse, it will get worse. And uh, I think if you just uh, take a brief review of the last 10 years of world history, US history, uh, your own history, Life is becoming more complicated, and the life and death issues are becoming more and more serious uh, with every passing day. And the central premise of this talk is that the problem really resides in the way that we think about our world, the way we define problems, the cultural assumptions that we follow, and the apparent methods we believe are necessary to pretty much solve any problem that we have, whether it's financial, educational, or health-wise. Uh, and I'm here to provide an alternative model for thinking about, essentially, uh, our social problems. But at the same time, uh, I will speak equally to what would be our solutions. And uh, I will use the word you a lot. And if any time I say you and you take it personally, then that's a good thing because it means that it is striking you uh, where it matters most and that's the way you think and the way you feel. Um, but I also am not uh, naive to believe that that might offend you. But, but I'm here to say that taking offense is really only a part of what we need to focus on. It's what we do after we take offense uh, that really matters and it will be a part of explaining why we have this problem that we do now. And so what I feel like I need to do first, uh, even though I look into the room and I see that a lot of you know me, but some of you don't know me, um, but then I would say even some of you that do know me uh, don't know maybe enough to understand why I do what I do and why I think the way that I think and, and the students in the back are smiling because uh, they probably do know. But I, I want to uh, go through this, which is essentially my credentials, okay? So forgive me, this is my narcissistic moment, uh, but also it's going to help to explain maybe why I say what I say, okay? And then maybe why uh, you're gonna have to maybe shift your perception and perspective in order to do that. I do have a PhD in clinical psychology, now, you might think, therefore, that means I'm an expert. And in clinical psychology, we refrain from calling ourselves experts. We prefer to call ourselves generalists. We have to know a broad range of theories and techniques about people, about human behavior, but not only at an individual level, but at an institutional level, at a group level, okay? And we have methods not only of observing behavior and understanding it, but uh, applying it to multiple theories simultaneously, offering multiple solutions simultaneously. And in doing that, we have to draw from across psychology and across other disciplines. So we're not trying to see the world through this narrow lens. We're trying to actually broaden the lens through which we see the world. And it, it's appropriate, though, in other disciplines of business, education, the arts, the social sciences, for there, for there to be a narrow focus because that helps to generate new knowledge. But we need people who are generalists and who are practitioners, to, so to speak, to bring this knowledge together in a comprehensible, cohesive manner in which it can then be 
applicable and useful across society. And that's what the generalist tries to do. Uh, I have about 15 years of experience, so I waited about 14 years to get this lecture. I thought it might be pre premature after one year. And uh, I'm not saying that's a lot of years, because some of you have even more experience in your field uh, as well. Um, but that's a pretty good amount of observations, okay? That's, that's my point there. And uh, with the PhD in clinical psychology, we're supposed to stay uh, up to date. And so it's been one up to date moment after another. I am licensed to practice, and some of you have heard this over and over and over, ad nauseum almost. But any of you who have a credential, okay, of some kind, a license, a certification of any kind, you know that it means you are state mandated by law to follow what you've been trained to do, or there would be repercussions. So it's as if to say, moment by moment, uh, someone with the license in this field or another has to be continually being prepared to practice what you've been taught with every person at every time and in every setting. Okay? Um, I have experience in legal settings. I have worked with lawyers. I've worked in courts, primarily family court. I've worked in the medical field. Uh, my area of specialization, if we call that in psychology, is in rehabilitation medicine. So I've been exposed to nurses, doctors, physical therapists, occupational therapists, both in small clinics, in large hospitals, in specialty clinics, and so on and so forth. And I use that now in terms of, of health uh, and how people can improve their health as well. And also in educational settings. Some of you don't know, my original license was as a certified teacher to teach in the state of Texas psychology and English and did that for a number of years. So there's a fair amount of pedagogical training that goes with that, but now as a clinical psychologist, I take that into school settings. Uh, I work with teachers, uh, teacher aides, principals, vice principals, coaches uh, in uh, elementary and secondary levels, both as someone who can assist, but also when clients come to me, parents, and their, their children are having trouble in school, then I will go into schools on their behalf and in fact, the next scheduled school visit is, is Monday morning, uh, in which a mother and a father and their son, uh, we will all be going down to uh, the, the, the middle school where the child is in attendance, and two graduate students will be going with me. So there's lots of observations across multiple settings. And at the same time, many different populations, uh, age five up to age uh, 70, 75, is about the age range of people that I've worked with. What that says is that I have some knowledge of what to expect of people at different ages, what their capabilities are, uh, what we know might be normal, what we might know is abnormal, but also the unique kinds of experiences and issues that people have to deal with at all those different ages. Okay? And so I have that kind of uh, exposure. Uh, various social economic groups as well, from the poorest of the poor, uh, some work at Bayer was done with uh, homeless shelters. Um, uh, in my work at Cressa, the economic uh, range is from those who uh, are on some form of disability, some kind of government assistance, up to uh, those who are lawyers uh, making high incomes. Uh, some of you also know I participate in the sport uh, known as squash rackets. And in that community, everybody's educated, everyone has a highest socioeconomic sets. As I've already alluded to it, I've worked across various professions, lawyers, doctors, uh, teachers, uh, obviously professors here, uh, but uh, all the different professions involved with uh, different staff members, uh, people in law, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and then uh, different nationalities. Uh, not only on this campus, as we know, uh, there's a, a fair percentage of people from other countries, but through the squash community and through the press of community and other population I've worked with, people coming from various nations as well. So there's a, a large array of observations, all with the primary objective of understanding what are the causal factors of human behavior. This I must know, and this I must understand. In my job, whether it's with students, research participants, clients at Cressa, 
or anyone else in a different profession when I'm working as a professor or a psychologist, at every one of those moments, all those interactions matter. All those interactions count. The ethics of the bill say that when I walk away from any of those interactions, I must have aided, assisted, educated, or helped them to solve a problem of some kind. So it's like being on the clock almost 24-7. And my wife is here, she can kind of attest to that. I'm just constantly practicing and reiterating these, these ways of trying to understand people. Okay? And so I know what you're thinking. Aha! Uh -huh. Just as I thought. All those psychologists, they're always analyzing people. Okay? So you got to be careful because they're going to figure you out and read your mind. And th this is essentially true, but w what you're doing there is. is really the first example I want to provide to you, which is, why would your first assumption be a negative one? And that, I would say, is part of our cultural landscape. This fundamental mistrust in people before you get to know them, rather than the fundamental trust in people until they may have given you a reason to mistrust them. Okay? And I'll also point out that that can happen the moment another person opens their mouth, or even before they open their mouth. That you are making immediate, quick, instantaneous judgments of people the moment you see them and the moment you talk to them. And I'll go through this process with you. But that was like my first example there, okay? But then maybe another reaction you might have to this is, oh, so Dr. Velasquez, you think you know something. Right? And you're going to tell us all what we need to know. So you think you're better than us, or you know better than us. And I would say, that's not my assumption. I'm doing this you know, to try to assist in the community of, of scholarship and, 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 and into an enlightenment and, and maybe give everyone a chance to use some of this information themselves. Uh, a large part of doing work with people that I'm supposed to help them gain new skills and knowledge they themselves can use. So, let's start with what people think bullying is, okay? People think bullying is, uh, if you get that stereotypic image in your mind, is the, the boy on the playground or at school who will push around and harm a, a, a more, a smaller, more defenseless child, okay? That's like the stereotype. And that is true. That is happening. We have seen it. I think while I go through this lecture, you may re recall even some moments of your own where you felt bullied, okay? And if I were to ask you to raise your hand, I bet all of you could recall some kind of moment. So it's, it's really strongly ingrained in our thinking and understanding to assume that bullying is that kind of problem, okay? So I'll start with this and, and, and begin to talk to you about way, a different ways you can think about the bullying issue. And I would start with this quote, it's not mine. But I agree with it entirely. Behind every harassed child, the victim, are a whole lot of clueless adults. Okay? And by that, I'm saying we need to shift our attention from the bully and the victim to the people in charge and the environment in which these things are happening if we really want to address this issue. And so through my observations of bullying children, schools, hearing from parents, seeing my own children in situations, here is what bullying really looks like. It is most likely to occur in unstructured settings. Uh, and there are many unstructured settings in schools, okay? Those include the playground, passing periods between classes, lunch, after school while waiting to be picked up, online activity, which you know about, and at these times, we rely on the least trained staff and sometimes parents to be in charge of these moments. Okay, so just stop for a moment and, and realize that's the setting. That's the preemptive moment prior to bullying. Okay? Um, I, I recall some early, early experiences at Presa Community Center, and there's some current interns and former interns present. Uh, when we first started at Presta, the, the, the undergraduate students were just 
kind of shocked uh, by the lack of supervision in these unstructured playground areas. Children were getting hurt from falling. Children were getting hurt by this harassment and bullying. Children were fighting back. And we, we noticed it immediately. And we recommend, as a solution, more staff. But not only more staff, but strategically place these staff at various points on the property where the children are actually interacting. The presence of adults is a great preventer of child misconduct. And when that started to happen, the conduct of the children really, really changed. And I think the interns who are currently here can say, it's not that bad. And, and, and I can see the difference there. But it's in these unstructured settings. The process also takes place in this way. The adults discover bullying after it occurs. Afterwards. Not while it's happening, not before it was about to happen. But in other words, they notice it and then they intervene, but the bullying has already taken place. And what can we say about the likelihood of that have happening prior to that? So is this the first instance of bullying against a particular child, or is this, this the first instance of that person committing an act of bullying? Very likely not, okay? So we're talking about a history here. We have, I have seen, and we have also others have seen, that if a, if a victim fights back, they are punished also. Now, schools are doing a better job at this, but too often because they don't see what happened and only come upon the bullying moment after it's happened, it is really hard to ascertain when it all started. Because there are plenty of victims who are fighting back hard. And when they see that, it can be misleading where this is coming from and how it happened. Right now, many schools require reporting bullying by children. Just tell us when it's happening. Find a teacher, find a staff, report it immediately. But I'm here to tell you what I know about children, and it varies from age. This is antithetical to child conduct. To ask a child to report on other children just is not a part of the way that children operate and the way they think. You are then setting them up for further bullying on top of that. Because now they are, what's the, what's the term? They're snitching, they're cattle tail. And there's another reason for either that same bully or a friend of that bully to retaliate. I'll talk about this in the adult and professional setting in just a moment. Okay? And ironically, this puts the victim in charge of their own safety. If you would just report it, we could take care of it. The most defenseless people in our society, we are putting in charge of their own safety. You just have to think for a moment about that, okay? It's hard enough for some children to even speak up and say, I need help with math. Now in this very embarrassing situation. It's embarrassing to be a victim of bullying. And now you go and tell an adult with this fear to a, a child's mind, this fear that I will be viewed as weak and defenseless and not strong. And that's the way children will think, not adults. Adults think, well, just report it. All adults report crime, so the police will come. It makes sense, right? But not in a child's world, okay? So there's, there's three cases here. Uh, let me start with the last one, uh, the client's son. This is the, the more recent one that we're going to a middle school on Monday. This child, on top of everything, is probably placed uh, in the wrong educational setting, labeled special ed, labeled mentally retarded, which is probably in, inappropriate, and put into a, a, a um, classroom that is separated from the, the rest of the school population. This is already a form of ostracization. The school describes this, though, as the appropriate educational setting for this child because the child cannot function well in the regular classrooms. 
Well, this is a question to be answered, is what we will say when we advocate for the family of the child on Monday. But on top of that, this child is obviously one of the, the many victims of bullying. And he represents what happens to a lot of victims of bullying, and there are many outcomes, including anxiety and depression, of course, and fear, and absenteeism, and illness on top of everything. But we've seen this really tragic phenomenon that victims, when they're continually, repeatedly victimized, become bulliers themselves. And then they enter into this world of engaging in misconduct, and they are then labeled as conduct problems. If you see that happening, that means that help has never arrived for that child. And they are now pooled together and labeled together with the others who are, had previously, previously been defined as losers. Uh, a previous client I had uh, whose daughter uh, was suspended from school for fighting, uh, the same scenario. In this case, though, it wasn't... Uh, being bullied for not being smart, uh, she was being bullied for being lesbian, also in a middle school setting. And every adult now knows to say that's not right. We should not discriminate based on sexual orientation. However, from all descriptions and after meeting principals and assistant principals, the school has a problem, okay? And they openly acknowledge that. And they openly acknowledge the fact that they were going to very soon implement new positive reinforcement strategies as a school-wide policy to stop focusing on the negativity of child behavior and to begin focusing on the positive parts of child behavior. And so it was sort of like acknowledging, yes, we're, we are heading off in the wrong direction. And in this case, I went to the school and I said, how are we going to remedy this? And. Um, they didn't have a plan, so I said, I suggest to you then that come Monday morning when she returns to school, that you have a staff member ready at the curb when her mother drops her off and walk with this child throughout the entire day and be within two to three feet of this child for the entire day. And of course, they scoffed at this. We do not have the staff and we do not have the time for any staff to be taking care of one child. And I said, oh, then what are you going to do? No answer. So it took a little struggle there for that kind of thing to happen. When the child heard this plan, she was willing now again to go back to school. And within one day, the problem had been solved. And the unique feature of that was that the children who may have been bullying her saw that this girl was going to be protected every single moment. And even, if, even though that protection stopped, the second day and every day after that, it, would, it could never be predicted when it could happen again. And it then became a preventative measure for this child to return to school. And I haven't heard from the parents since. Okay? So there you are engaging the people who are in charge to make the environment possible to prevent bullying. Okay? Not wait till it happens and let's make sure we have the punishments ready, and let's make sure we have the policies in place to know what to do next and after that, and can we and should we, and after how many times do we uh, suspend a child who's known for bullying? And who are the counselors that will be ready to counsel this child? I'm saying that model will never stop the problem, unless we're not interested in stopping the problem. Are we interested in stopping the problem? Okay, or, or are we just interested in doing something about it? Okay, and so that's where solutions come out later. Uh, I won't describe directly uh, the issue with my sons, but uh, I will say this, that it, it got bad enough that I went to the school board. Okay, uh, well I went to the school several times before I went to the school board. Uh, first time I went to the school was not during a, a, a bullying situation, but a decision the school had made, the principal and everyone had made, and I knew immediately uh, something is wrong here. And this was uh, in the early 2000s, okay, uh, where it was decided by the school that they were going to hire a retired uh, sheriff from Arizona to come to the school and teach everyone about proper conduct and proper discipline. 
I immediately jumped out of my chair, I'm sure, made an appointment by email with the principal the next morning at 8 a.m. and said, no, no, and no. And you, some of you know me, that's exactly who I said it. To say, what are we doing here? We are telling children, you are potential criminals. You are like just little criminals waiting to you know, cause havoc and, and riots at school that you need a sheriff to come in to say, this is how it's going to be. There's a new sheriff in town, so to speak. <laughs> so I went to the school board and said, right up front, why are you making criminals out of our children? At that time I went, I don't know if it's still true, it was authorized within the school district. And as you know, these school districts in San Antonio some are of the largest in the state of Texas. So to go to a school board, that means you are referring to hundreds of thousands of children all at once. It was at that time district policy that if a school administrator did not believe, did not feel like they could handle a child, they could call the San Antonio Police Department. And the police officer could come on campus and arrest the child for trespassing. And these are, these are examples of the punitive nature in which we have viewed children and their conduct. And this implicit assumption that law enforcement models will take care of children. And that's just another example of what I mean by we're not interested in preventing it, we're interested in responding, and responding swiftly and with severe punishment. That is a law enforcement model. Does not work with children, okay? Does not work with children. Children don't understand, okay? They don't. We also know that the bully was bullied at home. Spanking is a form of legalized physical abuse at home and at school. Now that's me saying that, and I put the right word in there, legalized, because in Texas you may, you are allowed to spank your children. And in some school districts, certain authorities on campus are allowed to spank children. But we do not define this as physical abuse. I just did it here. This is the kind of language that we need to use to protect our children, okay? If school is about learning, if discipline is about learning, then children have to learn from the discipline. And the research is really clear on spanking. Spanking is ineffective. Does not work, okay? That's not me, that's not Velasquez saying it. That's not a moral statement. That is a scientific fact. Punishment breeds anxiety, aggression, and misconduct. It does not teach children what they did wrong. And, in, and from what we know about different developmental stages of children, even if you chose punishment as a form of discipline, it needs to be appropriate for the age of the child. I had an experience in one of my first teaching experiences in a middle school in a rural community. When, when two boys came running into my classroom and one chunked a rock at the other one. I mean, this was serious, okay? I'm, I'm not denying it. That's serious. So I thought, hmm, this prompts a trip to the principal's office, okay? And, and if I didn't, I'd probably get in trouble because I, if I didn't, right? So I was covering all the bases. The child, age 12, 13, 14, was spanked with a large paddle, wooden paddle. And, and from that day, I said, no child was ever gonna go to the principal's office ever again. That was shocking to me. And, and, and I'm telling you what you already know, but, but in this, understanding that they're not learning from that. They're being harmed by that. And in the adult world, this would now be acceptable, except more current with new laws and Supreme Court decisions, and I'll get into that. And so it's like the world's getting turned on its head, because I want to say we would never allow that in the adult world, okay? for a supervisor to turn to another supervisor and say, that employee's conduct is so bad, we need to hit them. <laughs> See, it sounds stupid. We would never do that. But it's okay to do it to the least defenseless people in our society, okay? I mean, we gotta talk about it this way. If it's bothering you, I understand that, but we've got to talk about it this way. 
So the bully was abused at home. There's also emotional abuse, okay? Now, you probably understand that emotional abuse is bad. It's really bad. But this is way, uh, this is conventional thinking about abuse in general. If it leaves no marks, the child was not harmed. So even with the spanking situation, did you spank a child? I sure did. It could and hard, okay? But if there were no marks, it was okay spanking. The child comes to school the next day with a black eye. Then we begin to say, okay, maybe that was too much, right? But with the emotional abuse, we know it's there, we see it sometimes, and we really, you know, we bite our tongues and it's painful to watch, and, but we want to say, but no harm has come to the child. Well, new brain research has shown us that these moments shape children's brains. So you're, you are like damaging a child's brain. Would that be okay? When they say just say, made it, just say no to drugs, I think that's what they mean, right? It's going to hurt the kid's brain. Emotional abuse also hurts children's brains. They therefore cannot do well at emotional regulation. They, they don't do as well at decision making. They don't, their, their memory is impaired. Is, is this something we want to happen to children? Of course not. Everyone would say, of course not. But we need to make that point. So now we've got two insults. Okay? We know that this kind of abuse and assault of children contributes to what's known as conduct disorder. Psychology students in the, in the classroom know what that is. What's typically, though, the response to the conduct ordered, disordered child? Control, discipline, punishment, removing them from the normal settings in which, where children are, and doing what? Putting them in a setting where the other conduct disordered children are, and what does this sound like? Prison. This is, this is what we do with adults who commit crimes that require punishment. But we believe it's not so severe because we haven't sent them to prison. We just sent them to this other school. It's an alternative school. They're still learning over there, by the way. That, that's all the assumptions that go along with it. I, I don't think they're always learning over there. The, the abuse continues because now the child is not able to control their conduct, and so then the school disciplines, and then if it gets so bad, then juvenile authorities get, get involved. And we know in psychology research that the moment a child, a juvenile, or even an adult has that first incarceration, no matter what age, their probability of having a second incarceration goes up significantly. So we know in psychology, do everything possible to keep children out of the juvenile system. Do everything possible to keep adults out of jail, because that is damaging in itself. But here we have children who don't yet have the brain capacity to make appropriate decisions, coming out of environments which have been harsh and punitive and assaultive toward them, and we expect them to go to school and behave properly. And since we don't understand this and don't know what to do, don't have the staff to do it, don't have the capability to do it, we rely on the law enforcement model, which is punishment. And the cycle continues. Untreated conduct disorder leads to antisocial personality disorder, and these are the folks in our society who commit the worst crimes against persons. So here's, here's the model for bullying. And it does, it, it, it does not involve only the child. It involves other people. We say that a child needs to be able to perform well at home, in school, and in social settings with their friends. And if a child performs well in all three, good. They are going to be a successful child. We become worried if they fail in two of those areas. So if one area is already failing at the home, it's likely to produce failure in the school, and now we, the prognosis for that child for future development is poor. But if coming out of an abusive home of some kind, they can go into a school setting that is corrective, but in a different way, 
that is not also harsh and punitive and uses punishment. The child can thrive possibly. But if you take them from one setting and they go into a similar setting, and this is the segue to what I'm about to talk about from now on, which is our institutions are punitive and punishing toward people in general, not just children. To get to that point, I want to just throw out what are our cultural assumptions? What, what are the foundational beliefs of our culture? And uh, I know that sounds funny because we have lots of uh, cultural courses on campus. So I'm going to say we're talking about the culture with a capital T. It's all around us. It's in the air. It's in our institutions. It's in our thinking. It's in our, it's in our interactions. It's not going to have a label other than the culture. Okay? And we're all exposed to it. One of those is that dichotomous thinking is highly valued in our culture. It's highly valued for us to come to quick decisions about things. And it's usually one of two extremes. Are you a good person or are you a bad person? Did you do the right thing or did you do the wrong thing? Now I know we're intellectual enough to know there's gray areas. So maybe uh, I'm preaching to the choir here, but we got to realize we're talking about this whole society that we're in. These are the fundamental ways to think. What should we do? Leave the kid in the school, send them to the alternative school. There's always seems to be only two options about things. You know, should I buy you a gift or not buy you a gift? I mean, just think of the countless millions of ways in which we do that. That's there. It's always there. You'll see yourself doing it if you, if you notice it yourself. Another fundamental assumption is that people are evil by nature. Right? And if we don't have laws to say don't kill people, then we'll have a lot of people killing people. That's one of the assumptions of, of people who are evil. We need laws to govern and control behavior. Because if we don't, everybody's going to run amok and we're going to have anarchy and chaos in the streets. That's the all or nothing thinking also. That we can have mastery over nature. This has a lot to do with technology. Okay, Pulling oil out of the ground. Uh, putting metals together to create a cell phone. To make a computer. Cars. Cameras. Security cameras. All these ways in which, if we just master nature better, we have a better society. Okay? I want to add to this discussion the fundamental assumption about medicine, which is mastery over nature as well. That when you are sick, we just need to put a chemical in your body, <coughs> take an organ out, perform some surgical procedure, and you'll be healthy again. That is mastery over nature. That's like putting a body on a bed and tinkering with it. Take this out, add this, top off the fluids, you know, and put an additive in there. I'm using a car mop now, metaphor. But it, in many ways, it's just like that. And with medicine the way it is, doctors not having the time, nurses having a little more, but still not enough time to work with patients. And they'll all tell you they agree we have an idea of how they got there, but we can't do anything about that. And then maybe they'll send them off to a psychiatrist or a psychologist and give everybody the impression you're, you're crazy and loony, and that's why I'm sending you over there. But really, they're trying to say, we understand it's about behavior also. But still, medicine is just like that. And I'll go so far to say that a pharmacy is like a prime example of mastery over nature. Just find the right medication. We're seeking the cure for cancer. We're seeking the cure for autism. We're seeking the cure for, what are those cures? It's not changing environments. It's not changing people. It's how can we manipulate that gene? Or how can we add that drug? How can we kill those cells? How can we stop that process? Mastery over nature. Okay? History doesn't matter most of the time. This is one of the big contradictions in our culture. I'll show you how it matters sometimes, how it doesn't matter sometimes. And if you're confused by that, I understand, because I'm confused as well. Because I can see sometimes where people say, oh, that doesn't matter, that was long ago. And then sometimes when they want to dig up everything out of the past. Emotions are irrelevant. 
or another way to put that is we should not use our emotions, particularly in professional settings. That it's inappropriate to use those. Or, as uh, the social culture would say, you're getting too dramatic. You're, you're being all drama. And, and that's another way of saying, whoa, slow it down, tone it down. This, this devaluing of emotion is a part of the culture. I'll get back to this one. Extreme, meaning very violent or very catastrophic or damaging, and low probability events are the rule in our society rather than exception. We focus more attention on the outliers, the low probability events, the car that went flying through the intersection and ran into the telephone pole and people were hurt and killed. We'll use that one instance to then put up a, a, a stoplight there so that now 100% of all people that come through that intersection from there on must have to wait. Now, I know that's not really a bullying moment, but that's an example where we, we take something that happened once and now everybody is going to have to now experience some delay or some kind of control of their behavior because of that. I get very irritated with speed. <laughs> it's the same thing, okay? Uh, make it even more catastrophic, 9-11, and the plane that flew into the buildings in the, in the Pentagon. Catastrophic, beyond belief, yes. Historic, in magnitude, yes. But we use that day, and even till, till now, more than 10 years from now, there continues to be more and more and more control, rules, laws, as an outcome of that. We created an entire new federal department of Homeland Security, spending billions of dollars, fighting two wars, to do what? To prevent another one of those. Now that, that's a hard one to understand because it was so catastrophic, affecting many, many, many people. But it's a low probability event. And I know some would say, whoa, now you're getting into politics. It could happen any day, you know, and all of that. And, and I want to focus on that in just a moment. That's when emotions do matter, right? Our fear, our anxieties, our worries, our what ifs are governing our society, because it could happen. But we don't acknowledge that that's why we're doing it. We're doing it because of fear. We say we're doing it because it's pragmatic, we're saving lives, and it's the best thing to do. But really, it's because of fear and anxiety. See how many times that happens. So then, what happens is everyone is subjected to punitive processes to prevent low probability events. I tell the students all the time, 95% of all people are good people. You can dispute that, okay. You can say 80, whatever. Most people are good. Yet our approaches to health and safety of this kind are to assume that any one of you at any time could be that, that bad person who's in the 5%. And because it's happening so slowly and these measures are creeping into our society so slowly, we're all beginning to buy into it and say, of course, yes, we need to do that, of course, because we don't want that to happen again. But you're essentially saying, I know it probably won't ever happen again, but I'm willing to spend as much money as possible and have my rights and my privacy lessened for something that may never happen again. Another cultural assumption is that any infraction or crime can be punished multiple times. We talk about punishment as a model, and that people need to, say, do their time and be punished. And I would say, OK, that's on the books. And you know, some crimes actually do require some punishment. But let's get back to the, the bullying situation. A child um, pushes somebody around the hall. That's poor misconduct. Okay? You are suspended for the rest of the day. That's what the principal might do. Okay. Well, what happens next? Is that the end of the story? What comes next? Parents in the room know. If they're playing a sport, the coach hears about it, well, you're going to miss a game. The parent hears about it, 
you're going to get when you get home. I'm going to wear you out when you get home. They're inquiring. They're about to take a trip. Well, you violated the school conduct code. You cannot go on that UIL trip. And it just goes on and on and on. Now, I know you're, are you sitting there thinking, Dr. Velasco, are you calling that bullying? No, because that's a word that's been reserved for that kid that hits the other kid, okay? But if we want to talk about how we solve this problem, we can't just keep looking at the playground and saying, that's where the problem is. Let's take care of that, and we'll be okay, and the kids will be safe. No. It's our conduct in many, many other places founded on our cultural assumptions. There are more cultural assumptions. I want to start with this, and this is maybe my revisionist history moment, but bear with me. The civil rights era ended overt discrimination, where you could no longer say whites only, blacks not allowed, women can't vote, etc., etc. It just ended overt discrimination. And in, in a way, it's saying you cannot do these things. It's not saying the opposite, which is do your best to include these folks and stop this overt. It just ended. Unfortunately, the existing laws, rules of conduct, and workplace policies remain intact. founded on and based on the original cultural assumptions of the culture. What changed was now we're in the tolerance era, so now you're allowed to be here. Women and the ethnic minorities in this room are now allowed to be here, and we tolerate you being here. I know that sounds bad, but that's the language, right? Uh, one of these well-known groups that really has been working for decades on uh, bullying and hate crimes and other things, the Southern Poverty Law Center. One of their emblematic programs is about teach tolerance. And I'm all for it, yes, but that's so far from where we need to be. We can't just say, I'm okay with you being here. Because what we're saying, in effect, is you now must acculturate to this model. That's now the expectation. If you know English, it's because you had to learn English. If you're sitting quietly and not interrupting me, it's because you know you're supposed to sit quietly and not interrupt me. And, and that list is very long, right? We can spend here an hour just What are all the ways to acculturate? Which is essentially, what's the way to behave? that is acceptable. 